One thing I really remember from 2009 is the time I used to spend in the mornings before school watching the UK Top 40 charts and edgily criticising the general population's dreadful taste in music, while simultaneously thinking that the script were the best band on the planet. It was an odd time. On a video game front, as well as it being the last year that I clung onto my beloved PlayStation 2 before upgrading to the PlayStation 3, it was also a time when browser games were important to me. My friends and I would play Boxhead, Shopping Cart Hero, Age of War, Play Your Own Six Nations and others in the back of an IT class whenever the teacher wasn't looking. And I'd also play these games at home, in between flicking through my then relevant Facebook feed. But in looking for these browser based time wasters there was another type of game that I started to find, one which, unlike the games I just mentioned and unlike most games I played at the time, wasn't about action or strategy or silliness or incremental progress, but a type of game that wasn't really focused on gameplay at all. While I wouldn't have thought about it at the time, these were some of the first games I ever played that dipped their toes into that genre of art games. Games that were less about being games and more about being ways to tell interesting stories or evoke moods through the medium. This was something I would find to be commonplace in my gaming habits in the years after, notably with Fumito Ueda's Eco and Shadow of the Colossus, or that game company's journey, flower and flow. But at the time for me, it was very much a new idea. Now, I couldn't tell you what the first art game was that I ever played, but thinking back to the time, there were a few that stand out to me that I wanted to mention, and one of them is The Majesty of Colours. I fell in love with The Majesty of Colours was developed by Gregory Weir and uploaded to the internet at the end of 2009. It's a short game where the player controls a Lovecraftian sea monster in the dream of an unknown protagonist as they make their first contact with the human world. As the creature ascends from the darkness of the ocean, it sees light and a moving shape. And as you reach out and bring the balloon closer, the monster sees, for the first time, colour and falls in love. Played out on a single fixed screen, you have control over just one tentacle of this great undersea beast to interact with the world across a series of four scenes. The Majesty of Colours is a piece of interactive fiction. How do you choose to act? How do you choose to make the story progress? The first scene involves a man on a jet ski riding out across the surface. You know the right thing to do is leave him alone to keep him safe. But you don't have to. You could drag the man underwater and watch him drown, either out of malice or just curiosity. The creature's curiosity with this new life form and your curiosity with how the game will respond. It's clear from the game's first person dialogue that the creature, you, is pondering these choices without a clear sense of right and wrong. The creature's internal monologue is written in shorter, simple sentences filled with rhetorical questions and odd descriptions that emphasise its confusion, its curiosity, and importantly, its otherness. It's well written and impressive how such a simple game can create a believable character from such an inhuman monster. The Majesty of Colours lets you explore your possible actions and ensuing consequences and really makes you feel like a sympathetic underwater leviathan. Weir has said that this idea of a game on a single fixed screen that tries to build character through exploration of choices and multiple endings was directly influenced by another Flash game released a little earlier called I Wish I Were the Moon. I Wish I Were the Moon is a game about a girl who loves a boy and a boy who loves the moon. It's interesting mechanically, which is surprising for such a simple short game, and the idea of capturing a moment and then transporting it elsewhere to create variety and options from what initially appears to be an uneventful single screen is pretty cool. And the Polaroid film immediately gives the game feelings of nostalgia just through the Polaroid's heavy associations with such a feeling. However, I Wish I Were the Moon, while interesting as a concept, didn't really provide with it any sort of narrative. It created two characters and gave them each a motivation, the girl loves the boy and the boy who chooses between the girl and the moon, but beyond that there isn't really more that the game can give. While I Wish I Were the Moon has multiple endings, I'm only really calling them endings because that's what this sort of idea is typically used for, whereas I Wish I Were the Moon doesn't really have a narrative that could be properly described as ending. 
The Majesty of Colours does, and it makes each ending feel more impactful, and makes the five short stories about this unloved Lovecraftian monster a more worthwhile goal. The concept of multiple endings seemed to be a common idea at the time, and was also key to Dean Moynihan's One Chance, or as Marky Plyer called it, the saddest game ever made. In six days, every living cell on the planet will be dead. You have one chance. In One Chance, you play as a scientist whose major breakthrough drug that destroys cancer cells has developed an unforeseen catastrophic side effect of destroying all living cells it comes into contact with. With simple controls, you can move your character left and right and interact with objects behind you on the screen. It's another work of interactive fiction. Do you skip work to celebrate your drug's release? Do you return to work after the deadly side effect becomes known? Do you stay at home to look after your family? One Chance has a complicated tree of decisions that lead to the various endings, but what impressed me wasn't the range of stories, but just how compelled I felt to make the decisions that I made. I was driven to fix the mistake that my character had made before I was even part of the game. Every morning my character got up, and I couldn't bring myself to pick any other option than to head back into the lab day after day after day to try to write what I had put wrong until I knew it was a lost cause and gave up. The themes in One Chance are deliberately dark. By this point in my life I had played games like Grand Theft Auto filled with adult themes, drugs, death, prostitution, etc, but rarely did a game deal with it in such a heavy and sombre fashion. One Chance really does try to only give you one chance. If you quit and reload the game, it will show you the same screen you reached before you left. Although a master hacker could get around this with a bit of technical trickery, or just an incognito tab. It's a small world, and oddly enough, even though I never at the time cared about the people who made the games I play, Dean Moynihan is someone whose work I've stumbled upon again more recently and still loved. Notably the excellent atmospheric platformer Bird, video in the comments, and the reflective and respectful visualisation of the COVID-19 pandemic, Wash Your Hands. Dean Moynihan isn't the only late 2000s Flash game developer whose work I still enjoy today, however. The odd and, to be honest, not particularly good Don't Shit Your Pants was developed by Cellar Door Games that some of you may recognise as the team behind Rogue Legacy. The multiple ending interactive fiction style of art game wasn't the only thing I could recall from the time, though it did seem by far the most common and a game that tried hard to tie together mechanics and theme was Eli Pylonen's The Company of Myself. The Company of Myself is far more mechanically deep than the works of interactive fiction mentioned previously. It's a puzzle platformer about a lonely central character in a dreamlike grassy world whose two loves of the performing arts and a woman named Catherine have gone, and now he shies away from all human contact. As you play, the character performs a written monologue which serves to tell the game's story and also work as a tutorial for the controls and puzzles. Much like The Majesty of Colours, the dialogue is written in the first person to bring you into the game, and the tone demonstrates the character's mixture of sadness and confusion. To progress, you have to move into a green box and press the spacebar, but the key mechanic in the game comes from a time-shifting twist, where pressing the spacebar outside of a green box resets the level, but creates a ghost of your previous actions that you can interact with. The basic use of this is to jump on a ghost's head to make it over a higher jump. This working alongside copies of yourself, obviously reflecting how the lonely hermit tries to avoid interactions with any other people. The first true puzzle that requires this finishes with the self-deprecating line, I am grateful of my above average ability to work alone. Puzzle platformers, in my mind, are almost the defining indie game genre, with hundreds and likely thousands released every year, but even some of the better games now don't tie together theme and mechanics and story quite as well as this. The puzzles in The Company of Myself tend to be on the simpler side, with little potential for players to get stuck outside of perhaps the last two levels, but the mechanic is still visually and mentally interesting, and the levels are all satisfying to complete. On their own, however, they wouldn't have made The Company of Myself as memorable as it is, and instead it's the dialogue and accompanying atmospheric music that makes you want to keep going. The diary entry style first person text that appears during the levels narrates your actions with humour, and sometimes demonstrates how the puzzles reflect the story the character is trying to tell. And as you play through the game, you learn more about the character, about Catherine, and about what's really going on. 
So, why did I write this video? Was it just to bring up four decade old Flash games? Um, yeah, a, a little bit. As many of you may know if you've read any tech news, visited any classic browser game sites, or just generally used the internet, Flash is on its way out, with Adobe discontinuing all development this year. When I heard that, the first thing I thought about was all the games I used to play online 5-10 years ago that ran on Flash. Compared to what I've played in the decades since, with a growing appreciation of classics as I got older and the explosion of indie games, I have played games with more expansive stories, more varied mechanics, and certainly with more beautiful artwork, but I do still have fond memories of the games I've just brought up that began to push at the boundaries of what I knew a video game could be. And having played them again for this video, it isn't entirely nostalgia. These are still some strong, albeit short, experiences. Very short, in fact. I'm sure you could play all four or five games I've mentioned in this video in under a single hour. While it is the end for Flash, is it the end for the hundreds of Flash-made games that lit up our childhoods or filled a few minutes here and there over the years? Thankfully, no. In case you're worried that these pieces, potentially of your childhood too, are going to disappear forever, people have got your back. The good folks at FlashGameArchive.com are backing up all these excellent passion projects and silly games to make sure they don't disappear, and I'm glad that the state of video game preservation right now is better than it's ever been. Thank you for watching. I'll try to get back onto videos that make a little bit more sense soon, and probably reviews of more recent titles, but at the moment I am currently working from just my laptop until this country's lockdown eases further, and that limits the projects that I can really do at the moment, so this was something that just sort of fell into place with my current technical limitations and the end of Flash. But hopefully you still enjoyed it, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.